to encourage you this morning to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, the book of Jonah. Jonah, we're in the last chapter, chapter 4. We've been uh, studying a little short series of the book of Jonah, just four chapters, 48 verses. And uh, the theme we've seen in Jonah is he's on the run. Uh, the great thing about the book of Jonah is we, we all fit in here somewhere. In chapter 1, he's running from God, and sometimes we find ourselves running from God. In chapter 2, he's running to God, and sometimes we need to run to God. In chapter 3, last week, he's running for God. And today we find really the, the reason uh, Jonah was written. Uh, today he's going to have a head-on collision with God. He's going to see some things about himself uh, that's not real pretty. Uh, we're going to discover why he had such a hard time serving God. So Jonah chapter 4, let's go ahead and read the whole chapter. Uh, but it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Now let me pause and just say, uh, in chapter 3, we saw a great revival break out. And uh, this is why he's running from God. Because he knew, he knew, if he went to Nineveh and preached, he knew there's always that possibility God may bless. And uh, he didn't want God to bless uh, that country. And so it, it displeased Jonah greatly, and he became angry. And let me say this about the word angry there. Uh, the Hebrew phrase is an idiom that means to bring to the boiling point. It's where we get our English word, uh, that burns me up. Have you ever, ever been in a situation that just burns me up? That's where it comes from. Or have you ever seen somebody, and they're angry, and uh, maybe I wasn't around it, and you saw me and said, boy, he was hot. You ever use that phrase, he was hot? That's where it comes from. Uh, he, he's, not kind of, he's not kind of upset. Uh, he's boiling. He, he is angry, and basically he's going to say, I knew it. I, 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 I knew if I messed around with preaching, I just knew God was going to do something that I did not want to see done. Uh, verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to... to uh, forestall this, I fled to Tarsus, for I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in love and kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. He knew that because that's Exodus 34, verse 6. Uh, he, he, knew what, he knew what the scripture said, and uh, he knew that scripture was true, and if I preach, uh, well, you may do something I don't, I don't want to see you do. Therefore, verse 3, now, o Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. In other words, I would rather die than see God do something that I don't want done. Verse 4, the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah uh, to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plan. But God appointed a worm uh, when dawn came the next day and attacked the plant and it withered. When the uh, sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun heat down, uh, excuse me, the sun beat down on Jonah's head so he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about this plant? He said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the difference between their right hand and left hand as well as many animals? Uh, by the way, the book of uh, Jonah, as you just saw, ends with a question... There's only two books in the Bible that ends with a question. Uh, they both concern Nineveh. This is Jonah uh, talking about Nineveh and then the book of Nahum, which is about 150 years later after this. And sure enough, uh, judgment does come in Nahum. In other words, they, 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 they finally went back to their sinful ways. The, the next generations went back to their sinful way. I want to look at this today by having a head-on collision with God, which is needed sometimes. It's not a pretty thing. Uh, it's when you get in the presence of God and you let him search you. It's a good thing to do. King David said this in Psalms. He said, search me, O Lord, and know my heart and uh, see if there's any wicked way in me. It's a great prayer to pray when you have devotion time or even uh, Sunday before church. Say, Lord, what I, I, whatever's going to be preached next Sunday, I have no idea, you might say. But, Lord, the songs and the preaching and the Sunday school lesson, 
Uh, just bring me in your presence. Let me see who I really am. And Lord, when you do show me who I am, uh, I'll be quick to respond in obedience. I'll be quick to, to uh, make sure that you are Lord of every area of my life. So let me ask a couple of questions. One is, uh, is your comfort uh, more concerning for you than the compassion of God? And in other words, would you rather be comfortable than see God work? Don't be too quick on that. For example, I've known folks who have prayed, Lord, grow our church. Well, once the church grows, then we say, we're going to start two Sunday school uh, sessions. And I've had people come to me and say, over my dead body, because you're going, you, you're going to change my Sunday school class. That's the person who's like Jonah. God, we want to grow. And God comes in and says, I, I'm going to grow you. Uh, but we're not going to sing the kind of music you've been singing. We're going to do something different. You ever know somebody? Oh, over my dead body. Y'all getting quiet. You, you don't know what I'm talking about? Uh, I, I, I've been in churches that have grown. And I've had angry people come in and say, Pastor, do something. Somebody's getting my pew every Sunday now. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't, you're either new to the church or you're stupid. That's S-T-U-P-I-D if you're taking notes. And this is Jonah. Uh, J J Jonah has preached a great revival broke out. But he didn't want to see it to come to these people. Second thing is this. Second question. Are you more interested in material things than you are spiritual things? Because Jonah was. God says, I don't get it. You have compassion over a plant that's here today and gone tomorrow. But you don't care about the people of Nineveh. And, and we think when he says there's 120,000 people who don't know the right hand from the left, we, we, we know the city was bigger than that. There's probably 600 to 800,000 people in the city. Uh, we're thinking he's talking about children. That, that, that we're talking about children who, who like babies and two or three-year-olds. What he's saying is, Jonah, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. Even if you hate the adults, what about the babies? Well, what about the preschool kids? Even if you don't have grace for the adults, aren't you glad for the children? And then he even throws in uh, much less the animals because if I destroyed everything, the animals would die too. They, 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 they didn't do anything wrong. So I want to look at this today uh, and tell you this. Resentment in church people always comes when our agenda is different than God's agenda. Been doing this 30 years. Uh, have had an unusual ministry because of being on staff of churches. Unusual because of uh, being a director of missions. Unusual because I worked for the Georgia Baptist Convention. I was a evangelist at one time. And so I've been around a lot of churches. And, and it, it is an amazing thing. I've seen churches pray to grow. And then two years later they call you and, 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 and they have a problem because they wanted to grow but they didn't know Hispanic people was going to come in. Or they wanted to grow, but they didn't know black people may come in. This is Jonah. You have to understand that this is where Jonah is. In fact, did you catch that phrase? He said, when I was in my own country, there's a note of pride. What he's saying is, when I was in my country, that's why I didn't want to leave my country. Uh, he had a patriotic type of religion, which, by the way, is all across America today. There's a lot of folks who almost equate America with God. You ever, you ever notice that? A lot, a lot. A lot of folks do that, uh, which I tell you, if America is like God, wow, we're in trouble, aren't we? He's much greater than America. And so let's look at this today. Now he, he does something I've seen so often. I've known a lot of Jonas in my life. God did something. It wasn't what he wanted. And so he's over here pouting. I can tell you, I don't have time. I, I could preach the next six months. And tell you illustrates. For example, I've been in church for revival meeting. Uh, these true stories. 25 kids get saved. And somebody catches that Sunday night. Pastor, what do you think about? What are you talking about that kid that had shorts on? And it's like, you got to be kidding me. You had a church full of youth. But you know what they're doing? They're over here pouting. They're over here pouting. I, I, I want God to work. But I want Him to work the way I want to work. I preached before where God's moved in churches and somebody comes up to you and, and, and they'll say, Preacher, what do you think about the fact we don't have an organ in the church? And then you find out later the organ's been gone for 20 years. And you're thinking, wow, here's the person who anytime God's ever done anything, 
All they can say is they're like Jonah. You catch that verse? Jonah went and sat. He's pouting. That burns me up. And you just want the, you want to go back in a time machine and, and just jerk him by his shirt and say, wake up. You're talking to God. This is God's agenda. This is his kingdom. And here's what happens when we have resentment. By the way, let me tell you about resentment. God was working before you were born. And whatever cemetery they dig a six foot by three foot hole for you, he's going to be working when you exit. Amen? I, I can leave today and say, I'm mad. I'm going to preach again. Can I tell you? God could raise that from stone somebody to preach. It's not going to hurt God. Do you, 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 you understand what I'm trying to say now? There's not going to be means because some of us, we, we want to manipulate God like John. We want to say, I'm going to have a pity party. And, and sometimes that works with people. There are some people who will let you have your way because you have a pity party. But God won't. And by the way, mature people won't do that anyway. They're, they, they're, going, they're going to move on with God. So let me say a couple things about this. Uh, first of all, resentment always brings destructive results. Resentment always brings destructive results. I wrote three, three or four things down about this. And let's just say Jonah's over here and he's got resentment. Uh, he, 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 he resents God. Uh, first church I served out of seminary, I was an associate. Growing church, growing area. And uh, before I got there, one of my assignments when I was coming was we're going to go to two Sunday schools and two, two this and whatever. Uh, they already had two worship services, but two Sunday schools and there's some other things they were going to do. And so, uh, help us to do this. And I remember one Sunday school teacher was a lady who uh, just, just was opposed. I mean, I, they've been talking about this for six months. I just got there, and uh, two or three weeks later, I, I visited a few folks. I visited her and her husband. And I said, you know, here's what the church wanted to do. And they're out of Sunday school space and this and that and the other. And I said, quite honestly, I, I'm new here, but I agree with what the church wants to do because you're not going to grow anymore. You're out of room. And uh, well, I'm against it. I'm this and that. And I'm young, and I just finally say this. I said, well, you know... The, Two Sunday schools haven't come yet. Uh, who knows? That's what they said in verse three in chapter three. Or who knows? God may not do it. I said, "Well, let's just pray about it." You know what she said? I'll never forget it. I'm not gonna pray. Is like that? I'm not gonna pray. I don't need to pray. I don't want it. Now I'm gonna tell you. I'm glad she was honest. You know what she was saying? What she was saying is, "Why should I pray? It doesn't matter what prayer would bring. It doesn't matter what God wants. I don't want it." And I tell you why she didn't want it, because she had a large class and knew if you mess around with two Sunday school times, you know where I'm going with this? Probably I may lose some of my class. In other words, uh, her, her comfort was more important than reaching more people. And people get like Jonah, get over here, and they don't realize you can get bitter, you can get angry, you can reach the boiling point. You can have resentment. Or you can decide, I want God to do what God wants to do. Well, here's what happens when you have resentment. I, I put two or three things down here. First of all, it destroys your peace. And let me tell you what Jonah should have done. By the way, it ends with a question in the book of Jonah. We don't know this for sure, but, but I think this would probably be true. We think probably since God used Jonah to write this book, we think probably Jonah came around. It's possible he didn't. But the question is not whether Jonah came around or not. The question is, are you going to come around? The question is, if you've got resentment because God does what he does, or put it this way, does it bother you when God acts like God? Ever thought about that? When, when, when God acts like God, for example, if, if, if God should do this tomorrow, if God looks at my wife and says, come on home, does that bother me? Does God have the right to do that? Has the right, doesn't he? Absolutely has the right. And by the way, out of the mouth of babes, that's how some of you senior adults believe, don't it? God ain't got no right to change music. Yeah, he does. God ain't got no right to change methodology. Yeah, he does. And by the way, if you weren't so blind and ignorant, you know what you'd realize? What I grew up with 40 years ago was different than what 40 years before that. And if you want to know the truth, if we go back to Jesus' day and did what they did, we couldn't understand it. Why? Because they spoke a language that's not, that's not even a living language now. That the songs they sung, I, I would feel kind of strange to come out here with a robe on. Like Je Jesus usually had a robe because that's what, they, that's what they wore. I would feel strange to stand before you with sandals on. Isn't that wrong? By the way, there are people who preach with sandals. I, it's just I never have. But my point, my point is this. 
if you're not careful, instead of understanding he's God, he, he does what he wants. Sometimes I pray on Sunday mornings because I've traveled quite a bit. And sometimes, not every Sunday, but sometimes I think about, Lord, today there's going to be people worshiping you in multi-million dollar buildings. There's going to be country churches. There's going to be people in the bush of Africa worshiping underneath trees. You're God. And it doesn't matter if it's Swahili or Russian or English or French. You're God. It doesn't matter if it's the organ. It doesn't matter if it's the drum. There's instruments and songs we don't even know about. But you know, a lot of us get over here and we just we have all this resentment. And what Jonah should have done, Jonah should have got over here and said, wow, it's the greatest revival the world's ever seen. It, 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 there, is, there is nothing in history, Bible or outside the Bible, that compares to what happened. Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people, around 3,000 people got saved, is small in comparison to six or 700,000. The whole city turned to God. And God used him to preach the message. And he's over here, he's just, he's boiling, he's mad. And he's so mad, God says, do you have a right? He says, yeah, I've got a right to be angry. Now, I'm going to tell you, 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 you angry when God asks you, do you even have a right? And you look at God and say, yeah, I've got a right to be angry. And destroyed his peace. Hey, he could have rejoiced. Uh, he, he, he could have said, God, I would have never thought when you called me to preach that a city that could have been destroyed would be saved because you used my voice. I would have never thought. And, and by the way, you know what we learned about Jonah? His hypocrisy. Boy, he's in the fish's belly. God help me! But when he gets out, God, I can't believe you saved the Ninevites. Well, I saved you. You want me to save you? You know, a lot of folks are more concerned about their own comfort than they are about God's compassion. It, it, it completely destroys... Uh, your peace. Second thing I wrote down is this. Whenever you have resentment, it not only destroys your peace, it diverts your purpose. Diverts your purpose. You want, you want to go back in a time machine and say, Jonah, there's, there's babies in Christ. Is our terminology. That, that some of them don't know anything. They've been living. Get back there. Go do some discipleship. I mean, he could have went back there and, and, and said this, uh, uh, King, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you have called the folks to uh, fasting and repentance. Uh, by the way, you don't have to use me, but I'm here. I'm, I'm a prophet of God. Uh, would you like to have a few nights of revival service? Would you, would, you like, if you like, would you like me now to teach you how you should walk in God? See, that, that's something we miss there. In other words, uh, when the city got saved, he's on his way out and just, just angry and mad and, and I don't like it. And, and if I can't have it my way, I just assume, well, he says it twice. I just assume die. By the way, I know churches everywhere that made that decision 5, 10, 15 years ago. Oh, they still meet, but they're a shadow of what they used to be. Why? Because they said, we'd rather die than change. And God said, all right. And they die. And, and, and so he's over here, and uh, it, it diverts your purpose because there's so many great things that God could have done through Jonah. And again, it ends with a question. We don't know if everyone went back or exactly what happened to him, but we do know he's missing this important uh, part of his ministry uh, where he could be over there. I, listen, can you imagine walking through the city? And, and somebody over here says, man, I used to hate everybody, but I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I have a love for folks. And John can say, I can tell you, I can tell you. He, hey, listen, we saw in chapter 2, he quotes at least uh, eight psalms. Some Hebrew experts say he quotes as many as ten psalms. But he quotes at least eight psalms. Uh, he quotes uh, Exodus 34, 6, uh, here in chapter 4. He believes it. That, that's why he's saying to God, I believe your word so much, I knew if I went back, you're a compassionate God. You're slow to anger. So he could have walked back in the city to a pagan people who knew nothing like he knew. And he could have said, listen, you know this God who spared y'all? Let me, let me tell you how you ought to pray. Hey, you know this God who spared y'all? Let me tell you about stewardship. You know this God who spared you? Uh, let, let me tell you how you ought to worship. Listen, this God who spared you, uh, here's what y'all ought to be doing every week when you come together to worship. In other words, uh, he, he, he missed his purpose. It is a dream. But the problem is, 
It wasn't his agenda. Third thing I wrote down is this. It, it diminishes your productivity, which is similar to what I just said. Uh, there's so much more he could have done. Uh, there, there, there's so much more he could have impacted. Uh, there's so many more things he could have accomplished. But you know what happens? Bitterness destroys all that. If you don't like the songs we sing, you'll, you'll come every week and you'll just... I always thought it was strange. I've never heard this here, but I used to travel quite a bit. It's strange. Uh, let me give you an example. We, we sang a song today, and I've been in places where you sing some of those kind of songs, and so it's like, I don't like it. And the strange thing is, half the time someone tells me that, they don't realize it. But for example, we sang a song today. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. And I've heard people say about those kind of songs, I don't like it. And I'm thinking, how can you not like it? God wrote it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. That, that, whoever, whoever put that to music did not write that verse. It is God's verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5.20. He made him, and by the way, uh, in, in my translation, there's 21 words in that verse. Uh, John MacArthur says that's the greatest 21, verses, uh, 21 words in any verse in the whole Bible. It sums up the Bible. It's what the Bible's about. What, what's God about? He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteous of God in him. And we've got folks who are so biblically illiterate. I don't, I don't like that song. I heard that right before I came here to preach. I, I mean, before I became an interim. heard that from somebody I was in a revival. And I'm like, and I told him, I said, what's you not like? I don't even like the words. And I said, that's Psalms 3. I mean, it's Psalms 3, set to music. But what happens is, if you get resentment coming in, there's destructive results. And you, you, you won't like absolutely anything that God does. And then I put, it distorts your perspective, which is kind of sums up everything I'm saying. It distorts your perspective. Uh, you know what I've noticed about God? He does it with Jonah, but it's not old-fashioned. It's all through Scripture. You know what he does? It seems like with God, he calls me to do something. And, you know, it always seems huge. You know, you, you, some of you have been here before. You, maybe you never taught Sunday school class, but you thought like God's calling you to do it. And, you know, you kind of, oh, I don't, you finally decide to do it. Or, 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 or he's calling you to be a deacon. You've ever been a deacon. You're like, well, can I really do this? And, you know, you just fill in the blank. He's calling me to do whatever. And once you get into doing it, over time, you're kind of like, yeah, I, I, I can kind of do this. What I notice about God is anytime I get real comfortable, y'all remember this? It seems like he comes in and adds something else to it. You know what I'm saying? He, he, always, he always seems to put me in a position that requires faith. You know what I'm talking about? Requires faith, requires belief. It doesn't mean I have to change jobs. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I can no longer teach Sunday school. What it means is I may be in the same position, but, but, but he expands my view. For example, I may work in a water. And, and if I've never done it before, I may be like, well, I don't know, I've never worked around children. You know, how, how, do I, can I relate to a five-year-old, whatever it is, an eight-year-old, ten-year-old? And I may begin to do it. And by the time I get comfortable, then God comes in and says, uh, hey, that one eight-year-old doesn't have a ride to church on Sunday morning. You know where I'm going with this? I'm like Jonah. Well, Lord, I got my Sunday's plan. Me and my best friend, we go out and eat. Every Sunday, we go out and eat. What's that kid going to do for lunch? You gonna take him? Y'all know where I'm going with this? Yeah, have you ever had these struggles with God? Some of you look like you know what I'm talking about. You, you've never struggled with anything with God. Well, I can tell you, most of you don't tithe, so you're struggling with that, right? Not everybody witnesses, so you're struggling with that. that that's a command. Not everybody has a great prayer life, so obviously, when God tells you pray, call to me, I'll answer you. You struggle with that. And I'm just telling you, sometimes we get over here and I get all, I'm, 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 I'm fine. This is a conversation I have with God. You get over here and you're like, Dad, burn God, I just got comfortable with the one. I mean, I, I, I learned I can work with kids. I've got my comfort zone and God's like, uh-huh. And you're not careful, you're doing it with your own strength. Let, let me add something to what you're doing. So now you have to trust me more. I mean, let me... Let me put you in a different type of position. And the people who don't ever do that, what they do is they come in church and they sit in the same place and they never really accomplish anything uh, for the kingdom because they never get out of their comfort zone. 
Well, resentment brings destructive results. Brings destructive results. A second thing I put down is this. Uh, you can be delivered from resentment. That's the good news. You can be delivered from resentment. Uh, Lord's Prayer says, well, we call it Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. says this, Lord, deliver us from evil. You can be delivered from resentment. That's good news. By, by the way, some of you, you ought to be happy. You know why? Because some of you have, been resent, have had resentment for 20, 30 years. I know people. Listen, when I started the ministry, 19 years old, I knew people who were bitter. They're still living. They're still bitter. I don't know how long they've been bitter. I just know they were bitter when I grew up. They're church people. They're still bitter. So, so at least for 40-some years, they, 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 they've been bitter. And you don't have 30-some years. And they can be delivered. Now, how can you be delivered? I wrote a few things down on being delivered. First of all, you, you, you learn that God's world is bigger than your world. You ever thought about that? I may have said this here before. I remember the first time that I realized. I grew up in the East Texas area. And uh, I remember. I, I, I know where I was. I mean, I can see my feet right now on a certain street in New Orleans going to seminary. I can see where I was when it occurred to me, God is bigger than East Texas. I remember that. Now, it may sound arrogant, but by the way, some of you don't know that God's bigger than Cedartown, do you? I mean, to, to you, anything that's different time must be wrong. God is bigger than where I grew up. By the way, I Googled where I grew up this week. There's 125 people right now in that town. Isn't that arrogant on me? I mean, I, I remember I was standing, I was standing in New Orleans, seeing all the different kinds of folks. I remember where I was. I was in the French Quarter, seeing all those folks, and it just, it just dawned on me. Hey. God's bigger than my little town I grew up in. And see, Jonah didn't know that. Remember what Jonah said? When I was in my country, don't, don't read through that too fast. What he's saying is, you know, we're, we're Americans. We're this and we're that. And God says, you go to Nineveh. Because I, well, this is shocking. I love the Ninevites as much as I love you. There's no way. And so God's grace, God's, God's love is greater. Oh, God's world is bigger. And then God's love is bigger than his wrath. You ever thought about that? When you read scripture, do you believe that God's first response is this? You believe God says, what I love to do above everything else is, is crush people. Is that what you think? You don't have any verses on that. Because the verses say opposite. For example, 1 Peter, God is long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish. That's why anybody says, every once in a while I hear someone say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older now, but I sure wish Jesus would come back so I wouldn't have to face death. I understand. I hope he, I hope he lasts. I hope he waits another thousand years at least. Why? Because there's people who get saved. Aren't you glad he didn't come back in 1920? Aren't you glad he didn't come back the day before you got saved? Oh, man. See, he's long-suffering. And... and, and and, and, and Jonah, if Jonah had thought for sure, if he didn't know Exodus 34, 6, if he didn't know the nature of God, you know what he would have done? He would have said, man, I'll be glad to go to Nineveh and preach that judgment's coming. But, but he gave himself away in chapter 4. Because in chapter 4, he's burning with anger. He's reached the boiling point. He says, I just assume be dead. I'd rather be dead than the Ninevites get saved. I'd rather be dead, God then your will be done. I want what I want. What about, what about me and what I want? And it's a lesson that God's love is greater than his wrath. And that, that's what Jonah said. Jonah knew that. He just didn't like it. Uh, J J Jonah understood that if you mess around with the people you don't like, that God's a God of long-suffering compassion, and he wants to give grace to folks. And I... I, I, I knew there was that possibility. Third thing I wrote down was this. God wants to cure us of our prejudice and greed. And it goes hand in hand. The, the prejudice is obvious. The greed is the fact that, that, that God tells them, you're more concerned about a plant. Can I tell you? 
There are folks who are more concerned about a car than they are Jesus. There are folks who are more concerned about a boat than they are Jesus. I don't have time. I, I can tell you a thousand stories. I, I, I've been in people's homes before where I've said, well, we sure love to see you come to church. And uh, I've had men more than once say, come okay, here, let me show you something. And, and, and open up the garage. That's a $30,000 bass boat. I've got to get my money out of it. I mean, I'm, sometimes I have to work on Saturdays. Sunday's the only day off. By the way, I'll tell you the flip side, too. I have seen some of those men five, six years later come make an appointment to come back and talk to me. You know what they say then? Can you help my 19-year-old son? He's strung out on drugs. Well, I'll do my best. But the reality is you made a decision and you're reaping consequences. Uh, everybody's got some kind of vine. You know what I'm trying to say? When, when, when I grew up, a uh, little part of Texas I grew up in, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, I used to hear this all the time. It made a pressure on me, by the way. I used to hear all the time, the little church I grew up in, when Dallas Cowboys were playing, I used to hear all the time, people, deacons, everybody would tell the pastor, you just hear them, the pastor, you know what? Uh, game starts at 12. Game starts at 12. Game starts at 12. And uh, it always left an impression on my mind that we ought to be out of here because the like, Cowboys playing at 12. I mean, that's just that's the, way it the way it works in Texas. Everybody has a vine that they sit under. Well, I would serve God but my vine's my friends. And I don't know what, what would they think about me. And, and everybody has a vine that they care more about. And God's, God's answer would be, you're more concerned about a house than you are God. You're more concerned about a job. You're, you, are, you, are, are you really investing in something that in the grand scope of eternity is here today and gone tomorrow? And then God's reasoning, as you can imagine, is flawless. He says, Jonah... Do you see how ridiculous this is? You're concerned about a plant that didn't even exist yesterday. It's not yours. You didn't build it. So if you're concerned about a plant that was here less than 24 hours, should I not be concerned about the people who I've made? Should I not be concerned about a city that has 120,000 people in it who don't even know the right hand from the left? And the first time they heard the gospel, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. She should not have concern about this. The last thing I wrote down is this. God wants you to be involved in his mission. That's the greatest thing about the book. God wants you involved in his mission. That, that's why there's purpose in life. There is a God, and God wants you involved in his mission. The problem is there's all these other things uh, surrounding us and all these choices about am I going to be precious? Am I going to be a nationalist? Uh, am I going to be materialistic? And the theme of Jonah really is this. The theme of Jonah, the, the lesser theme, the great theme is God has compassion. The lesser theme is, which is important to us, is I have a choice. Am I going to be self-centered or am I going to be God-centered? Am I going to be somebody who says, Lord, I've reached a stage where it just doesn't matter to me what I want. I've reached a stage where I at least am mature enough to know your kingdom is all that's important. What you want, what you desire, how you want to do things. Everything else just really doesn't matter. Lord, I want, I want your kingdom to shine through. I want, I want your will to be done. And I tell the Lord this all the time. Lord, do anything you want that accomplishes your purpose, even if it, even if it disrupts my methods, uh, even if it's not how I grew up, uh, even if it's not what I'm used to, even if it blasts me out of my comfort zone, the issue is, Lord, that your kingdom be exalted and that people get to experience your love and your compassion. So let me ask you as we close up the book of Jonah. It's a book about being on the run. And I promise you, you are in the book. You may be in chapter 1. You may be running from God. You may be in chapter 2. You may be on your way running back to God. You may be in chapter 3, which is where we wish we all were. You, you may be running for God. You may be serving God. Or maybe you're in chapter 4 and you're having some head-on collisions with God and you're realizing some of your problems in life is due to the fact that you want what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. And God's bypassing those things you hold sacred, those traditions or those methodologies. Or you're learning, hey, God loves the Muslim as much as he loves me. God loves the homosexual as much as he loves my next door neighbor. 
God loves the orphan as much as he loves the person who's not an orphan. Hey, God loves the homeless person who this morning woke up on the streets of Atlanta, soaked with vomit and smelt, drinking of alcohol as much as he loves the deacon who's here this morning or the preacher who's here this morning. And, and what God does is he steps in. If we say, Lord, I no longer want to be self-centered. Lord, I want, I want your perspective. I, I want your will to be done. It's amazing what God will do with a life like that. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. We're going to have an invitation time. <clears throat> we don't know what Jonah did. We, we think we do. We think he made things right with God because God used him to write the book. We think that. But the far more important question is, how are you running today? Running from God, running to God, running for, running into and if God looked at you today and said, shouldn't I have compassion on people you don't like? Is it okay, God says, if I act like God, I'm Lord? Is it okay if I do things the way I want to do things? What would be your response? Are you going to set out away from God, angry, mad, resentful, bitter, Frustrated? Or are you going to run to God? We well, have an invitation time. I would ask you to pray just in your heart and ask God to search you. Let Him speak to your life. And whatever He would say to you, just obey Him, whatever that would mean for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, I just, I just need to make a little decision in my heart. I just need to begin to take those steps towards God. That's awesome. I, I don't need to know about it. That's just awesome. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I just feel like I need to kneel at the altar and pray. Hey, you're welcome to come and pray during the invitation. The altar's open. Or maybe you say, I, just, I need somebody to pray with me. Well, we'd love to pray with you. Maybe you've been coming today and, and uh, you're looking for a church home. You say, I just, I just uh, believe God's leading my family to join this church. How would I do that? The easiest way to join in a service is just come down and say, hey, we'd like to join. We'd be glad to talk to you about it. Maybe you're here today and you say, I've been thinking about giving my life to Jesus, but I'm not quite sure how. You know, the easiest, easiest way to do that in a service is come out and say, I'm, I'm just not sure. That's all you have to say. I'm just not sure. I know what you mean. We'll show you how you can be sure about heaven. Father, we come before you today. We give you this invitation time. Uh, Lord, how relevant is your message through Jonah? Lord, we're all on the run doing something, either for good or bad. Uh, Lord, we're all running, either living in your will, or Lord, just frustrated and out of your will. Father, show us today where we are and help us, God, to have the boldness and grace to do what you want us to do. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to be with the stand this morning. Everyone standing. We'll have an invitation time.